Welcome everybody to our, um, I think this is probably our fourth or fifth leadership event. And we're just over halfway through August, which is obviously Leadership Festival Month, which is pretty exciting. And the theme, I guess, for Leadership Festival Month has been be the change you want to see in the world. And tonight's discussion um, is going to be fantastic because we invited three leaders along who have been able to fill those shoes, who have made change in the world, which is um, pretty amazing. So we're all pretty pumped to hear from them. So I'm going to let Josh Bell, who's one of our young leaders, uh, introduce our guest speakers. Mm. But to kick off tonight, I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country. Now I'm based in Melbourne, I'm down in Brighton East. And um, so I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting. And I pay my respects to their elders past and present and the Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. Um, one thing that I did discover, um, which I'm going to put in the chat, is usually in Melbourne, I've been um, acknowledging, I guess, the Wurundjeri people, but in my actual part of Melbourne, that is not Wurundjeri territory, and it actually hasn't been defined as yet. And there's this amazing map that you can look at to find out who are the First Nations people in your area. So. I will pop that in the um, in the chat and then perhaps after this talk or whatever, if you note it down, you can actually go in and have a look. I was actually, um, I guess I wasn't aware of how many tribes there are throughout Australia just by looking at that map. It's really fascinating. So there you go. So I guess without any further ado, I would just like to introduce our wonderful MC this evening, who is Josh Bell. So Josh is a has been a youth ambassador for Canteen um, for a while now. At 18 months old, he was diagnosed with liver cancer and he underwent surgery and chemotherapy. With a scar across his stomach, Josh is now 18 years old and cancer free, which is wonderful news. According to him, Josh's loves are writing, art and making music. From Canteen leadership to the release of his debut album, we know Josh, for striving to be the change he wants to see in the world. Put your hands together for our Josh Bell. Okay, over to you, Josh. Thank you. Thank you so much for your introduction, Felisa. You're fantastic, as always. Um, this is a little unconventional, but I'd like to be the change I want to see in the world. So I'm going to start the night with a few piano chords right now. I really hope you can hear them. Otherwise, you're just going to look at my video and it's going to be nothing. Okay, after that massive performance uh, and with that, Yay! thank you. Thank you to everyone in attendance <laughs> for taking the time out of your Tuesday night to be here. And extra special thanks, of course, to our truly awe-inspiring guest speakers who I'll be introducing shortly. I'm extraordinarily excited to have this beautiful combination of people with us tonight. Um, personally, my passion lies wherever I can make a positive change in the world. Sometimes I express that through the music I make, but equally it's panels like these, which really truly bore my heart. So thank you everyone. Um, now that everyone knows who I am, I'm very happy to introduce you all to all our three incredible panelists. Heads up, it's gonna be a lot of me speaking, so just be prepared. Um, first off, I'd like to introduce you to Nairi. Nairi is a shining example of a woman who has channeled the hardships she has endured into making positive change in the world. She was born in Papua New Guinea and spent her first few years in New Zealand. She moved to Australia and became renowned for her beautiful voice, thoughtful costuming and powerful pop sounds. Nairi has acquired countless accolades, including four National Live Music Awards, an FBI Radio SMAC Award for Best Live Act, and the inaugural Australian Women Music Award for Artistic Excellence. A breathtaking performer, Nairi has graced the world's most renowned stages from Splendour in the glass, gl grass all the way to Glastonbury. In the company of greatness, she has toured alongside the likes of Alicia Keys and Leon Bridges. She has also composed for dance companies and has showcased her work at experimental art spaces. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us today, Nairi. Hey. 
Now I'd like to show off my uh, gender non-conforming nail polish as I introduce uh, Navo. By using their unique voice to highlight often neglected issues in Australian society, society facing public backlash along the way, Navo has lived their life in scope of the change they want to see in the world. Navo is a queer, non-binary and Jewish writer, performer, activist and public speaker based in Melbourne. They run workshops in schools and professional development trainings in workplaces around transgender identity and language. They are the author of award-winning Finding Nevo, a memoir on gender transition and a contributor to Kindred, a queer Australian young adult anthology. They are a mentor for the Pinnacle Foundation, one of Out for Australia's 30 Under 30 and a member of the Gender Euphoria cast, Australia's largest all trans and gender diverse show on a main stage. Thank you so much, Navar. Last, but certainly not least, I'd like to introduce our very own Joey Lynch. Um, his work towards ensuring young Australians have access to the support they desperately need is what makes him an inspiring agent of change. Love the hand sign. Uh, Joey was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma in September 2008 and joined Canteen in 2010 when he needed support after his first stem cell transplant. Since joining, he has developed skills as both a leader and a mentor. He has served in almost every leadership position available throughout his time in Canteen. He has worked in Victoria as a program leader, peer mentor, deputy chair, and chair on a national level as a member of the Member Advisory Council prior to joining the Canteen Board of Directors. Thank you so much to our three amazing panelists. Now that I'm done telling you your own stories, uh, can each of you wonderful panelists please tell us a little about yourselves and what change you've made in the world. Um, could we please start with Nairi? <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, hi everybody. Um, my name is Nairi. I um, am a Papua New Guinean woman. I've be been living in Australia since the year 2000. Um, I was living in Sydney for probably about 10 years, and now I live on the beautiful Duck and Jewel land up on the central coast in New South Wales. Um, <clears throat> I, um, I was born in PNG in a little town called Leigh. When I was about nine months, um, <clears throat> my parents moved us to New Zealand because um, my dad got a scholarship to study um, cartography, which is a study of maps. And um, Somehow it worked out that we were in the right place at the right time when I got diagnosed with um, cancer of the adrenal gland. Um, and I was about three at the time when I got diagnosed, they, the doctors had told my mom that I had worms. So I was on like a steady dose of deworming tablets for a while, <laughs> three years of age. And then finally we found the right doctor who told us that I had glioneuroblastoma, which, like I said, is cancer of the adrenal gland. And so I underwent their um, treatment for about three years. Um, I did radiotherapy, chemotherapy, um, and then it was obviously a success. So we moved back to PNG and I lived there till the year 2000. And then we moved to Australia at that point. Um, I studied jazz uh, for a few years up in Mackay, Central Queensland. Um, got tired of my degree and so I moved to Sydney to pursue um, probably a more realistic experience of what a performer and a musician um, is and can be and ended up working with a whole bunch of really amazing um, artists like Paul Mack, um, Luke Brown, um, got to tour as the introduction said, we did a lot of incredible festivals. Um, and I've been doing music for about 15 years now. And I don't know what else to say. I, um, I have a son, he's two years old. Um, his father's um, Jewish, so we call him a little Papua, Papua Jew Guinean. Um, <laughs> and um, and 
Yeah, I'm still making music and I'm, I'm, I'm really excited. I mean, it's a really challenging time right now making music in the pandemic, but I'm noticing how creative people are becoming um, during this time and that excites me as well. So that's me. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, I was also diagnosed with a blastoma, so I really resonate with your story. I really appreciate it. Um, now, I'd like to ask you, Navot, can you please tell us about your story and the change you have made in the world? Sure, yeah. So thank you so much for having me. Um, and I'd really like to take a moment to pay respect to elders past, present and emerging on the land on which I stand, which is Wurundjeri land uh, of the people of the Kulin nations and that this land is stolen. Uh, it was, is, and will always be Aboriginal land. Uh, and I want to really hold that in my heart as I am storytelling, because storytelling has been on this land for tens of thousands of years and part of oral history and cultural exchange. And I'm incredibly privileged to be standing here and to be telling these stories. And I want to highlight as well that there is no change that is more important on this land than the sovereignty of Aboriginal people. Um, and that if First Nations justice isn't really front and center in everything that we do, then we're probably not change making in the right ways. Um, so I guess for me, I, I think it's kind of a hard question, right? Of like, what change have you made in the world? Cause it's like, well, I don't know, like you, you tell me. Um, and I think maybe other people on the panel can resonate with this as well, but there's something about being a marginalized person that puts you in a position whereby you have to be a change maker, that you have to be an activist and it's not necessarily by choice. I didn't necessarily choose to have a body that is political. Uh, I just happen to live in a world that politicizes difference. And so I've had to make change because it's been very clear to me that the world that I exist in doesn't have space for me or isn't crafted around difference or diversity so it's less it's it's less of a conscious choice I think and it, it is obviously something that I choose to engage in every day but I really look forward to a world where people can choose to be change makers and that it's not something they are sort of born into or thrust into uh, but for me I was assigned female at birth um, which is really important language it's good to pick up on that and not use language like born a girl or born a boy and became something else. Um, I wasn't born in the wrong body. I was born in my body. There were just a heap of expectations that were put onto that body that weren't really appropriate. Um, I could talk about that for a really long time, but I basically came out a million times. I like to come out every couple of years just to keep people on their toes, you know, keep things spicy and interesting. Uh, so yeah, I, I came out as a lesbian in high school. I was the only person that was really out in my small Jewish community in high school that I knew of. Um, and then I decided in year 12 amongst the anxiety and depression that it was a really good time to start questioning my gender. Highly recommend it. Uh, so that was a pretty complicated time. And I think that high school is a pretty difficult experience regardless of what struggle you may be having. Like I think the most popular mainstream kids struggle in high school. So uh, when you're experiencing a very different lens, it's a lot. Um, and I came out as trans and I began my transition at 17, my social transition. And at 18, I went on testosterone. And it was kind of through this process of transition and learning more about gender and the social constructions and expectations that we put on ourselves and other people that I came to realize that I was non-binary and that maybe really radically, I just want to be treated like a person and gotten to know as an individual without this set of expectations of hobbies or colors I might like or outfits I might wear. Like I dress um, pretty much based on the weather and comfort levels and um, what is appropriate for the, the thing that I'm going to that day, not what is the uniform that has been laid out for me by genitals or by society's expectations. It's just, I'm going to wear what's comfortable and appropriate. Um, so yeah, I guess there's something radical about being really authentic and being really genuine. And I guess by um, carrying yourself with the confidence of a mediocre white man, uh, you can really set a bar for <laughs> change in the world. Um, I think embodying a politicized body 
causes change, it causes rifts, it shows people that they don't have to pretend, um, that they don't have to conform and that they can authentically be truly who they are. And I think that that can be a really empowering and exciting opportunity for people. That was beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. I have so much I want to ask you about now. <laughs> um, finally, I'd like to ask the same question to Joey. Can you please tell us about your journey and the change you've made in the world? Um, yeah, it was briefly, thank you for hosting this event and thank you to, firstly, thank you to everybody for tuning in and also, you know, I'd just like to reiterate the acknowledgement of country I too am broadcasting from Wurundjeri land and it's important that we pay our respect to elders past, present and future and recognise that they're, they are the original custodians of this land and this is Aboriginal lands. Um, but I was a uh, as the bio says, diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma, cancer of the lymphatic system in 2008, joined Canteen um, a couple of years later, waited until I turned 18 to actually do anything because I didn't. I wanted to be able to sign the permission slips on my own. Um, and ever since then, continue to be a part of the organisation as my treatment has continued. I'm not going to bore you uh, with all the details and if you google Joey Lynch cancer that significantly more information will come up there but needless to say from around 2012 onwards things got pretty bad probably should have died probably three or four times if I'm being honest with you I mean there's probably a couple of staff members in the room I think Chelsea's in the room could probably attest that yeah I probably shouldn't be breathing at this point um, it reached the point where I um, ran out of curative options in Australia and required uh, a clinical trial that was only available in the United States. Um, so I had to go over and crowdfund for that. Uh, basically, I was very much in a privileged position though that I had a network of family and friends and was able to wrangle up enough support that although we did end up needing to take out a second mortgage on the house, it wasn't as large as it could have been and I was able to go over and get the trial. But as part of that, um, I became involved in Canteen's clinical trial initiative, um, which has done a lot of work. And I'll talk about that in a second, but even before I get to that, we're talking about change makers and all of that. And I also want to reflect upon even before I got proper real and started working in the clinical trials advocacy space, I think I already was a change maker in the world in the sense that I was doing all of this leadership stuff in canteen and I'm not even going to pretend that that was a completely selfless thing on my part. I, the empowerment that I received from doing that, the, the, the worth that I took from that at a time where I didn't, wasn't recording a lot of wins was something that was very important to me, particularly as somebody that dealt with a number of mental health issues, social anxiety, depression, dropping out of high school, even before my cancer diagnosis. But at the same time, everything that I did in that leadership space, as much as it was supporting me, it was also enabling me to be a change maker because of the fantastic way in which Canteen is organised. Every decision Canteen makes at some point um, every decision that will affect the organisation of Canteen at some point involves the perspective of young people. The actions that we take are guided by our mission to be there in the corner of every young person living with cancer. Our empowerment of young people raises their voices. So every time I was doing something on a local level or an advisory level, I was changing Canteen. I was changing the world because every piece of input, every piece of leadership I was doing in Canteen was helping us better reflect our purpose, our mission, which was in turn improving the lives of other young people um, living with cancer. So I was already a change maker then, just like every young person in Canteen that they don't even have to be an official leader. Every young person in canteen that puts their hands up and asks a question about, can we do this? Is it, can, you know, I think this, they immediately become a change maker and they immediately begin to make the world better for other young people living with cancer. So, and so I, I think that's very important to emphasize when we're talking about the canteen leadership space that, you know, we all have different leadership paths. We all do different things, but each and every single young person in canteen is a change maker. Um, obviously, I 
did some other stuff along the way um, because I couldn't access um, a clinical trial in Australia. Um, it's probably not the best thing in the world because as I said, I was in a very privileged position. There's a lot of young people around the country that wouldn't have been able to marshal support, um, enough support to get over to the United States, which basically would have amounted to a death sentence for them, which isn't fair. Um, so we began, uh, I was very fortunate enough to play and I'm not even going to front, it was a very small part. We have some fantastic staff and advocates at Canteen that do so much work behind the scenes to, um, to get in the ears of important people and government to get these things over the line. But I was able to play a part in advocating for clinical trials um, in Australia and the establishment of a fund. Uh, funding that Canteen was able to administer and start giving out to prospective clinical trials so we could bring those to Australia and we could give young people um, living with cancer access to them so they didn't have to crowdfund, they didn't have to rely on family and friends you know giving up their own money because that is one thing I hated every single second of having to ask friends family acquaintances people I'd never met for money I hated myself every second I was doing it so we were able to bring trials out to Australia so other young people didn't have to do that um, and I think that's you know I think that's done well um, we I was like I've been lucky enough since that time to become a consumer advocate on the uh, expert I put expert uh, expert advisory panel I put expert in quotation marks because any panel that has me on it can't be an expert panel but um, we're able to still meet and help administer uh, the funding uh, that goes out for that so I think yeah it's been a hell of a journey but that's one way that I have been trying to um, exhibit change in the world and as I said I'm not even going to pretend that it's been um, completely a one-way street I take enormous value out of being able to do that um, and you know it gives me an enormous sense of pride to be able to give back and try to improve the world for others but um, it and it genuinely does feel good but yeah it's it's a worth been a worthwhile experience wow thank you so much for sharing joey um already i'm truly blown away by the incredible messages i'm taking out of this when this was just introductions i haven't even asked you any questions yet and it's already incredible so I've hardly asked you any question yet so i really appreciate um your wonderful responses I'd like to move us now away from the introductions, everyone knows each other, um, to I will ask some questions to the panel, which will eventually lead to the audience can ask some questions. So first, Navar, um, I know you touched on this question in your introduction, so feel free to be the one to expand on this first. All three of you have created great change in the world. Do you feel it was intentional? Or did it feel incidental, like it happened along the journey? Yeah, I think I'm going to choose a non-binary answer, if you will, um, in saying that I think it's both. <laughs> I, um, I think that there is an incidental influence that you might have as a marginalised person or as a young person who is brave and speaking out about your journey. I think that people really connect with storytelling and they get so much out of it. Um, but at the same time, I think that it is also a choice that I make. I think uh, as a young person, you know, I came out as trans in 2013. And although that really isn't that long ago, the cultural landscape for being trans in that time was completely different. I didn't have any representation of trans people whatsoever. I didn't know that trans men existed really. I didn't know that non-binary people existed. I didn't have Laverne Cox and, you know, even Caitlyn Jenner and, you know, so much representation of transness in the media really like compared to when I was in year 12. And so I guess my goal in my work was always to be the person that I never had growing up, was to be that that person, not, I don't love the term role model or inspiration or anything like that because I think it's too weighted and I think it pedestals someone beyond humanity. Um, but I wanted someone 
that I could look to, to know that I would be okay, to know that I was real and that I was valid and the experiences I was having were real. I think that there's this like collective um, gaslight, which is a way of denying people's reality that happens in our world when you live in a world that is so dominated by majority narratives, that are so dominated by able-bodied narratives, by white narratives, um, by upper middle class narratives, straight, cisgender, you know, like it's so hard to imagine yourself into existence when that is all you're seeing all the time. Uh, and so I think being able to write my book, for example, and write myself into existence and be the author of my own story when so many people had shaped that story for me or projected a story onto me, was incredibly empowering. And I think that that is such an amazing thing that young people can do is write yourself into existence, is assert who you are and say who you are and stand up for what you believe in and not let anyone else tell your story louder than you do because that is what you are an expert in. You are an expert in your own story and you get to write it for yourself. No one else is more of an expert in that than you are. Great, thank you, Nava. Um, I'd like to pass this question to Nairi. Um, you've created great change in the world. Was it something intentional or did it feel incidental, like it happened along the journey? Um, I think because I had cancer at quite a young age, so I was about three years old when that happened, and it's quite an informative time as a child. And... I remember going through treatment and all, all the elders around me, like my mum, my grandparents, my father would always say, no, you've got to be strong, you've got to be strong. And when you're three years old, you have no idea what that means. You're like, how, how do I do that? And somehow, like I think children are quite resilient in the fact that they somehow figure, that, figure out how to do that. And so, I had quite an early crash course in learning about resilience and learning about um, how to find that inner strength. And I've taken that throughout my whole entire life. So I think that it, it definitely wasn't intentional for me. I think that that's how I've learned how to live. And that's how I've applied myself to many different areas of my life, especially with the music industry being so fickle and so um, challenging, especially for me as a woman of color, um, who's also a Pacific Island woman, woman as well. Um, it's really served me well having learnt how to be that resilient and how to operate as a minority person within the context of this country. Um, so yeah, I don't think it was intentional at all. I just felt like everybody needs to learn. Everybody, everybody has the right to, to get in touch with that inner strength. Everyone has it. Not everybody knows how to get in touch with that. Fortunately for me, I fortunately or unfortunately, I learned that at quite an early age. So my whole life's work is about inspiring people to um, feel like they can reach for more than what they've been given. And um, yeah, I'm not mad about it. And that's my story. Thank you. I'd like to pass this question finally to Joey. You've created great change in the world. Was it intentional or did it feel incidental like it happened along the journey? Um. I mean, once again, I would have to say it's a combination of both. There are, there is without a doubt, a number of unintentional aspects of my pathway to creating change, which I absolutely 100%, you know, never would have chosen for myself. I mean, my entire uh, journey to creating change is predicated on a diagnosis of cancer when I was 16 years old and you know, a series of twists and turns, which leaves me still in treatment to this day. And it's one of the great contradictions of my life in the sense that I am immensely proud of the change that I've been able to bring about. I realize how lucky I am to be able to have brought about change and 
aided the lives of other people, but it's still one of the great unknowns in my life if I had to go back and do it all again, knowing the pain that I would experience, the pain that though my loved ones would experience watching me go through it, if I had to go back and do it all again and had a choice about whether or not I would be diagnosed with cancer, would I do it? And it's an answer that I don't know the answer to. It's a question I don't know the answer to. So um, to some regards, it has been incidental and there are other incidental aspects um, of my life that have led to me taking up uh, opportunities to bring about change, which I don't have much control over. I mean, I'm not gonna front a, a lot of my ability to create change and advocate for things like the clinical trial and serve as an ambassador for Canteen and um, in later life in my work as a journalist, elevate the stories of others is built upon the fact that via both the verbal and written word, I am excellent at bullshitting. Um, if it hadn't been for that sort of skill set, would I have been able to implement change? Probably not. Um, but then again, at the same time, there definitely is some level of conscious decision to create change. I mean, obviously, as I said before, it's been immensely, immensely uh, rewarding to be able to advocate for clinical trials, take on leadership positions in canteen. Um, but at the same time, um, it's something I really wanted to do to give back because there was also a sense of obligation there that, you know, given how bad things during my cancer period, my major cancer treatment got, the fact, you know, I probably should have died. I have to think that, you know, my the support I received from Canteen, the mental well-being provided me with a number of tools which helped me internally keep fighting and there's a great sense of obligation in my mind that comes um, with that but and so there was some level of deliberate um, embracing of that but I think it's important to also recognize that um, that was just my particular moves to a cope with um, my cancer diagnosis and b embrace you know, my ability to create change, that's my technique and it doesn't make, you know, the technique of anybody else um, who are trying to implement change any less valid. If somebody doesn't want to, you know, I think it's important because we, are, I am speaking to a lot of canteen young leaders. I, I think it's massively important to point out that, you know, it's just equally as valid to, you know, just go and talk to a young person on a program that needs it you're changing that person's world. And that's just as worthy as celebration as anything that I do on a board level. Um, and it's, you know, just as valid, and, you know, and if you don't feel as though you're in a position to, you know, volunteer your time or you don't want to volunteer your time for a certain thing because you don't have time, you've got uni work, that's just as valid. Um, so I think it, it's, it, my leadership journey was definitely, um, a combination of incidental and deliberate decisions um, but I don't think there was anything particularly about special about my decisions it's just the way that things played out for me and you know like I said it's am I grateful for it well I'm grateful of everything post diagnosis but like I said knowing what I know now would I do it again I have to be honest that I'm not sure I would Thank you, Joey, and thank you, everyone, for your for your answers. I feel like I'm really drawn to the humility in all of your answers, that these are three people that have absolutely made incredible change, and yet the first thing they go to is how everything around them is what made them create the change that they did. Um, it reminds me of a quote. One of my favorite musicians is Pharrell Williams. And he, he has this thing about it's the universe and it's moments that conspire towards your success. It's, it's not just the actions of one person. Um, which brings me to a question to everyone. Do you have a favorite quote or motivational mantra you stick by? Um, I'll direct that to Navor first. I don't know if I have like a specific quote 
of, of anyone that I can think of um, off the top of my head, but I have a friend who I think about this all the time, um, but they are a tattooist and an artist and a zine maker and they made this zine called It Doesn't Have To Be Perfect, It Just Has To Exist. And they gave themselves a week to make this zine and just not engage their perfectionism and just get it done. And it's their favorite zine. And it's just so beautiful. Like it's about growth and about acknowledging our weaknesses and our flaws and that we just have to get up every day and keep trying, that we don't have to be perfect, that perfection doesn't really exist, but we just have to, have to keep going. And I think particularly when it comes to my writing, like I really struggle to write. I sit down and I'm just like, I can't write. I'm not a writer. I've never done this before. I, couldn't possibly do that <laughs> um, and I just keep telling myself it doesn't have to be perfect it just has to exist and you can edit things once it's written but you can't you can't do that when there's nothing there so I think that's something that I think about a lot is I just have to do my best um, and keep putting one foot in front of the other and some days my best looks like just getting out of bed some days it looks like not getting out of bed um, and that that's fine because it doesn't have to be perfect Thank you. That's amazing. And I, I really feel that I'm constantly writing and I feel like the worst thing you can do for writing is to try and write perfectly. Um, I would like to direct this question to Nairi again. Do you have a favorite quote or motivational mantra you stick by? Um, I, I mean, a lot of who I am is, I owe that to my mother who's, she's quite an She's incredible. She's, I think, one of the main reasons why I got through my treatment was how much of a pillar of strength she was for me. And throughout my treatment, she had just had um, my younger sister. So she was in maternity ward whilst I was in the in pediatrics at the same time. So she was rushing back and forth from both hospitals just I don't know how she did it, but she did it. My father would be fainting every time he saw me in hospital with all the um, uh, tubes in my body. So she had to really carry the load. And I mean, her particular story is quite incredible as well. I mean, my grandmother couldn't read or write. Um, she birthed my mother by herself in a pigsty. Um, my mother grew in, uh, she was born into a family that didn't look upon women as valid members of society. So my grandfather refused to put my mother through school. And so my grandmother had to kind of squirrel away any kind of coin that she came, uh, came by just to put my mother through school because my grandfather didn't want to have anything to do with it. So now she's a doctor of environmental science and like, thriving uh, and she one of the things that she imparted to me was if there's a will there's a way and that's something that I've carried with me throughout my whole entire life you know if there's something that you really really want to do it doesn't matter if you've had cancer doesn't matter if the world has kind of turned their noses up at you because you know you're different it doesn't matter. There's always a way, you know, there's always a path forward and you can create those spaces for yourself. Um, so yeah, that's the one that I'm going to drop here. If there's a will, there's a way. That's amazing. Thank you. And I, I love the, the stories that you're giving to like imbue these quotes with such meaning and they're already such incredible just words to exist as, as statements and affirmations. Finally, I'd like to ask you, Joey, the same question. Do you have a favorite quote or motivational mantra you stick by? Um, it's funny that this question comes out mostly because I think my answer would actually be it's an autobiography. However, I think it comes back to what I was saying before about how everybody's the way, every, the way that people seek to change the world, everybody's technique uh, for doing that. Um, is valid and it's what works for them um, and it's the same that goes for sources of motivation because my probably one of the most important 
things and mantras and books in my life was uh, an autobiography of an individual named Bill Romanowski. Now, um, it's probably not going to be one that a lot of people even watching this would get much use out of because Bill Romanowski, I'm going to move straight up with you, probably isn't the nicest person in the world. He was a NFL linebacker for a number of years. He played for the San Francisco 49ers, Philadelphia Eagles, Denver Broncos, and Oakland Raiders. He won a whole bunch of Super Bowls with the Niners and the Denver Broncos. Um, and quite frankly, there's a lot of, you know, his personal ideas and that which don't really mesh with me and they're not how I would want to live my life. However, when I first read Bill Romanowski's book, it was a gift from um, a member of a uh, gym that I worked at. I worked at um, a gym uh, when I was in treatment, early on in my treatment. Um, and reading through that, there was one thing that jumped out at me was uh, Bill Romanowski's um, insatiable desire to improve himself and always compete and be the best that he could. Um, and that wrong personally for me because I'm not gonna you know lie this is probably not a technique which I would be running out and advising canteen to adopt with any of their other young patients and quite frankly as a board member I'd be you know ringing around asking what the hell was going on if they were however when I was going through treatment the biggest thing that you know helps get me through a lot of it was I turned it into a competition I was competing against myself. I was competing against anything that I could conjure up. If there was a certain treatment that meant that you were supposed to be in hospital overnight, you could be damn sure that I would be trying to figure out how to do it as a day center visit. If I was supposed to be in hospital for a week, I would be trying to figure out a way to get out of there in two days. When I got an allergenic stem cell transplant, um, where you're supposed to be in hospital for a number of months because they pretty much destroy you, uh, infuse somebody else's stem cells and build you back up again. Um, I, I asked them what the shortest time anybody who had ever spent in hospital um, had been, who, getting that treatment had been, um, found that out, and then B asked that they get me an exercise bike from one of the uh, medical rehabilitation rooms stick it in my I wasn't allowed out of the room for infection control um, stick it in my room and then I decided I'm going to get out of here quicker than anybody else has before and I was by two weeks um, so and that's why I found that book so useful because it was the right thing I needed at the right time um, and I think that's what's the most important about mantras about words to live by it's about finding what works for you and as i said this is an autobiography which i don't think very many people would get a lot out of um but at the same time it was exactly what i needed and i think that's what's the most important when it comes to mantras that we don't look for others to provide us with what's going to be a perfect for others to provide us what's going to be perfect for us the only person that can determine what one needs as a mantra as a guiding principle is ourselves and that might shift depending upon our life situation at the time the people around us so it's just important that you find what works for you um and you utilize that and you're unashamed in utilizing that Thank you, Joey. It's incredible from all your responses how it feels like mindset has such an impact on the way you approach making change. Um, I have a few questions directed at each of you individually. Um, the first I have for Nairi, but before I ask it, I'd like to share some breaking news to the room. I'm so happy to announce Nairi has just become an ambassador of Side of Stage for Canteen. Let's get a virtual round of applause, please. Throw up those clapping emojis on Zoom. <laughs> amazing. It's so, so amazing. So to my question, Nairi, can I ask why you've dedicated so much of your time to support Canteen? 
I um, I mean, I've waited my whole entire career <laughs> to be asked to be involved in something that's like, um, that I can, I guess, give back. Um, and I feel quite lucky and feel quite privileged to still be alive and around to experience life the way that I have. And one of the things that I, um, I really wanted to do as a young child was to, I mean, when you're going through treatment as a young kid, um, you know, you're in a room with other kids that are fighting other cancers and you wake up one morning and the person that you've made friends with in the next bed is gone. And how do you explain that to a child? You, you just can't. And so like I had a lot of friends and I lost a lot of friends through my treatment. And so one of the things that I really wanted to do with my life is to live my life to the point where I felt like I was doing justice to the lives that were lost along the way during my journey with cancer. And, um, you know, I'm so privileged and so excited to be an ambassador for Canteen Inside the Stage um, because I feel, I, I mean, the thing for me is community. And I think whatever it is that you're struggling with, as long as you are part of a community, I think it makes the struggle less of a struggle. So, and for my parents, especially as parents of someone with cancer, they really benefited from being part of a community, whether it was the Ronald McDonald House or whether it was Cam Quality. Um, these are the initiatives that really helped them along and I really want to give back um, in that way and be a part of something that can help change the lives of other young people that are um, battling cancer right now and that's really important for me. Thank you so much, Nairi. Um, I actually had a pretty similar experience growing up in a ward um, with hepatoblastoma. So it's really, truly inspirational. And I, I hope to one day make the same sort of impact that you have. Um, I'd like to direct an individual question to Nava. Um, this is actually a question from one of my best friends who I consulted uh, before coming on. Uh, they are an incredible young writer and they're also currently transitioning. They ask, could you walk me through your experience of becoming an author with a public voice as a young queer person in Australia? Yeah, I mean, I think that for the most part, I have to say my experience in publishing was a kind of a, a freak incident. Like it wasn't how publishing usually goes, I think. And I do think it's very hard to get published in an Australian context as a marginalized person. I think that there are more and more opportunities coming up now, but it was so wild. I was um, 19 and I was doing public speaking stuff. I've been a professional public speaker pretty much since I was 19. And I was giving a speech with my mum about our journey together through my transition. And there was an author there who was like, this story is great. I'm going to tell my publisher. And I was sort of like, yeah, sure. Okay. And she told her publisher and I didn't hear anything for months. And I said, I don't think this is going to happen. And then she just said, just wait. Publishers are notorious for taking a long time to get back to people. And uh, I got a phone call from this woman who was like, do you want to write a book? And I just thought, surely this is a prank call. <laughs> uh, and I met her and I sat down in front of her and I said, look, I'm telling you right now that I'm an unapologetic, outspoken feminist and I'm not going to dilute my ideology to be more marketable. And she was like, me too. And we shook hands and yeah, it was just kind of wild. It just happened that way. And I had no idea what I was getting into because also I, I was 19 and I really thought that the book industry would be like Hollywood or something that they would like try to steal my rights and like steal money from me. And I had nightmares where like there were executives in suits that were telling me that they were going to edit my transness out of the book <laughs> and that I was 
protesting and that my book was then made into a film that a cis person was playing me. And so I led protests against my own film. Um, so I was very afraid of what was going to happen. But it turns out that the young adult publishing in Australia in particular is like such a firstly female dominated space, but just really lovely and wholesome and caring and nurturing. So I highly recommend if you want to write books, to go into young adult. I think the adult writing world can be different. Um, but yeah, I was really, I was just super privileged and lucky that that happened. Um, and it just kind of went in this huge whirlwind and snowball effect. But I guess my advice to young writers who want to get published are just write as much as you can. Um, just get a pile of crappy writing behind you because that's the only way to get to good writing. But I think, I, again, it's that thing of I'm like, if I can't write something perfect, I shouldn't write anything at all. But actually creating bad art is the only way to get to good art and that the people we respect and we admire have so much more terrible art in their backlog than we have anything. And so to really like aim to that and, um, let go of the ego a little bit in that process and just uh, remain curious and do lots of lots of reading I think as well. Thank you Neva. you're such a beacon of light I feel like I'm smiling every time you talk um, my friend will be very happy with your response thank you. I now have a question for you Joey and this is probably my final question so we have time for the audience to ask questions. As the chair of Canteen, how do you advocate for Canteen in your everyday life, not just in the important meetings in the boardroom? Oof, um, well, I think there's two ways that one can serve as an advocate for Canteen. There's obviously there's the official channels where you are formally representing Canteen at events or in discussions with external stakeholders, which um, you know, it's generally made pretty easy for me. As I said, Canteen has some of the most um, well-qualified and passionate people working for them, not just in the country, but in around the world in the AYA cancer space. And, you know, the work that they do organising me to just, all right, you go to point A, talk, you know, bollocks for five minutes and then leave. That's dead easy for me. That's the easy stuff. Um, and the, really the only thing I need to do on that front is just make myself available um, and just open to, you know, doing things. And that's generally easy. I think the more, the more important way that I um, represent Canteen is just in my day-to-day um, -day life, just by living the values of Canteen, using the lessons that I have you know, I've been privileged enough to learn from Canteen, to learn from the amazing young people that have come before me. You know, like I sit here now and I kind of have to pinch myself because I mean, I'm chair of the board and I look back at some of the young people that I've known that have been chair of the board or even just sat on the board and I'm like, I'm nowhere near as good as them. So I just, I just try to have to live up to you know, maybe it's a concoction in my own mind of their own accomplishments and their own qualities, but it's something I have to try to live up to. And then at the same time, there's also just living the values of the organisation. It's just going out there. I mean, I'm sure every canteen member talks about um, the vibe of the organisation. And if you are a canteen member of a certain vintage, you will remember uh, the values that we did once have before they were faced out for being far too long and confusing but um it's about just going out there and in your day-to-day -day interactions being the type of person that you know you want you would want looking out for you if you were first joining the organization and you needed someone to be in your corner it's about going out there and recognizing that everybody is in a unique situation um and trying to support them. It's about creating spaces where others can use their voice. I mean, I work as a sports journalist, as a soccer writer for um, a number of organisations. I mean, I'm freelance. It's actually kind of hell trying to get regular paid work. But one of my um, more regular gigs is working for ESPN. And it's been one of the 
most fantastic things at ESPN is that I've been able to use um, my Mickey Mouse imbued platform to elevate other people's voices that I think really need to be heard and you know like we try to do at Canteen and you know because I've been um, in Canteen I recognize the importance of whilst I am communicating their, their words um, on the written page or in my case more often than not on the screen my thoughts and opinions about this matter isn't what's important it's about elevating their work recently I um, did a story with Central Coast Mariners defender Ruan Tonyik who when the A-League returns he took a knee um, in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement and I knew that yeah, it's a, that would have been a great opportunity for me to, you know, rah, 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 look how socially conscious I am, rah, rah, rah. But my voice wasn't important in that. It was about Ruan and what Ruan was doing. And that was a lesson that I'd taken from Canteen that, um, well, it, I like to think it's something I would have known regardless, but it was really reinforced by Canteen, knowing that you need to create a space for others to use their voices and have their voices heard. Um, so that's how I think, you know, I go out and represent Canteen. It's not just, you know, the boring putting on a suit and shaking hands with some politician that pretends to know your name for five minutes before he forgets it once he's brief, once he's briefed on the next issue. It's about going out and living the values of Canteen and representing the organisation in my actions every single day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joey. Um, speaking as a young person using Canteen Services, I'd like to extend my personal thanks to all the work you do and the board does to support people like me. Um, at, at this point in the night, I believe uh, it's my time to shut up. I've said a lot of words, I've asked a lot of questions. And now it's the time for the wonderful young people in the audience to ask questions in the chat box if they have not been asked already. Um, please send all your questions in into the chat box. I'm pointing at the chat box on my screen right now. You can't see it, but just trust me. Believe me, it's there. Um, I'm probably going to hand over to Felicia now. Thank yes. you all so much. So, so, so much for um, answering my questions and for listening to the beautiful panelists answer my questions. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful job, Josh. Just amazing. So... I'm just going to cancel that spotlight. You're, you've got a long career ahead of you on TV, I'm telling you right now. So um, I've just got, just while we're waiting for some questions to come in, I've got a, um, a good one for Nivo, which I'm putting in the chat, because I was quite, quite intrigued with your, um, the Hollywood blockbuster kind of idea. And I wondered, you know, who would you be happy to play you in the Hollywood blockbuster finding Nivo? Oh, that's such a good question. I mean, I feel <laughs> like I am, like I do love attention. So if I have the option, I would like to play myself in a Hollywood blockbuster <laughs> film. I mean, please, if anyone's looking for casting, I look, I, I'll do what I can. Um, but alternatively, I don't know, my list of like famous trans mask folk is not very long. Um, there's a particular person, I can't remember their name off the top of my head, but they're in the show Work in Progress. I feel like they would play a really great me. There's also a really cute trans guy in Shameless that I think would play a good me. Uh, but yeah, I'm quite willing to take that role if it presents itself. I think I wouldn't be qualified for any role as much as I would be qualified to play myself. Absolutely, that's fantastic. Now, Alexandra has asked, can we have some inspirational book recommendations? So maybe, um, Joey, is it, I mean, you've sort of mentioned one tonight, but is there another that uh, springs to mind that, uh, that you particularly love that's been inspiring? Um, I'd have to admit that, you know, as I said during the whole spiel thing, um, it, Bill Romanowski's autobiography did help me, but it's only going to help people that are slightly insane and consider trying to murder themselves under a barbell a good time. 
Um, <laughs> so maybe only myself and Chelsea. Um, I think maybe, I think the important thing is, as I've said, everything is so unique. I think if there is somebody that you admire, particularly a historical figure, it's just going out and reading about their life, particularly, you know, if you can find autobiographies or biographies, that great, that's great, but even long form articles um, and just going out there and off the beaten path and even just exploring the news, so to speak, finding, you know, like I'm not gonna front the news these days, 80% of it, as somebody that works in the news, 80% of it is clickbait trash. However, if you can find these good outfits still doing long form journalism that go out there and tell stories of people who aren't, you know, famous, who just are trying to get by, you can find so much inspiration just from that. Awesome. I've just realised the spotlight's on me. Lucky I wasn't picking my nose or anything. Anyway, um, <laughs> so we have a question here, a good one from Simon. What changes would you like to see people make that would create a more equitable world? That sounds pretty good. Nairi, have you got some thoughts on this one? Oh, I think we've got you on mute. We're gonna unmute you. Unmute. I'm muted. Um, ah, man, I mean, I think there's a lot of reading to be done. There's a lot of, um, I mean, we live in a pretty exciting and overwhelming time at the moment. There's so many resources being posted up on social media about how to learn about, you know, different um, marginalized groups. Um, and I think it's just on everyone to make that time, to prioritize that time, to read up on things or to even, you know, I think it's okay to ask people, you know, oh, how do you want me to refer to you? Or how, you know, what's acceptable? And to be open to having a dialogue and not being offended when someone pulls you up about things. Um, but yeah, I think, I think just taking that time, I mean, I think I feel like everyone in this group is, is here for the right reasons and here to create that change. So, and I, I feel like we're all kind of wanting to be in that same page of educating ourselves and, and making that time to do that. So I think just, I think also in, in with saying that, I think it's also important to also pace yourself when because there's so much information being thrown at people right now to realize that it can be exhausting it can be emotionally exhausting especially for me having to read about things about people of color like i get so <laughs> exhausted and emotionally just drained from just seeing myself being reflected in the media so um i understand that there is so much information out there and i know that it's important to pace yourself but um i think Right now, there are no excuses for unfairness because the information is out there. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Okay, so um, we haven't sort of had any more questions, but I guess one, one thing that um, I wanted to ask, and I guess especially with COVID-19 this year, it's been a really tough year and I just wondered, I mean, along your journeys, all three of you, um, there's been really tough times. And I just wondered if you had some advice for our young people, you know, when, when times get really tough and you're feeling depressed or a bit down or anxious, you know, what do you guys do to sort of pick yourselves up and get back to, you know, the main game? Yeah, I guess I can, I can jump in there. Yeah, um, go for it. I think, you know, something I find really helpful is thinking back on hard times in my life and then realizing how long it's been since those times um, and how quickly the passage of time moves us through. And that at some point this is also going to be behind us, you know, and that these hard times are what make us really strong and really resilient and define us and, you know, shape who we are and, 
Um, I don't think we need to find the positive in every struggle, especially when we're in it. Um, but I think it's just taking things day by day and being really gentle with yourself. You know, for me, like I've got to-do lists every day and I find that really helpful to keep me motivated. But on the hard days, my to-do list looks like get up, go for a walk, have a coffee, take deep breaths, be kind to yourself, you know, like it's every little thing I need to do. And at the end of the day, I'm like, oh, I did so much stuff. Cool. I'm actually really great. Um, I also write love letters to myself. I write love letters to my body parts. You can go on my Instagram. I just posted a poem I wrote today about my hips. Um, so I write love letters to myself and it's a way to extend the love that I would give to a friend or a lover or a really close person to give that back to myself. Um, I think about myself in the third person sometimes like it it's one thing to say you know I'm not feeling very well today I'm going to stay home and have a bath and eat some food and that that feels fine but there's often a lot of guilt or shame that comes with that um, but I find if I say like oh Navo's feeling pretty sick today I think I'm going to take take the day off and take care of them, run them a bath, make them some food. Um, that makes me feel really connected to myself in a way that it feels like I'm my own best boyfriend or my own best partner or my own parent or something, you know? And I think that that's a really nice way to approach it because we're so much more empathetic towards other people than we are to ourselves. So when we make ourselves in our mind into someone else, it gives you that level of distance to be able to be gentle and kind. So I think that's, that's my best advice. Yeah. Can I add to that, Felicia? Absolutely, go for it. It was so beautiful, Navo. Um, I mean, speaking on that some more, I feel like that's something that I probably will try to take on as well, writing letters to my body parts, because I feel like as someone who's been mutilated constantly <laughs> by, you know, operations, I've gone through so much of a love-hate relationship with my body especially as, you know, a woman. And I really love that. That was so amazing. And I've been thinking about that recently about how to appreciate my body more. And since having a child, you know, that was also quite traumatic. I had a C-section and I also had my cancer scar open up as well during that point because I had so much pain throughout that pregnancy because one of the reasons was that my cancer scar was... Uh, stretching during the pregnancy so I've come out of this whole experience going oh my god look at my body you know it's like it's so <laughs> it's so crazy mutilated and I feel like that's something that we can all take on who've been through that to just go actually you did well you know you did really well you brought me through this like our bodies are so incredible. So I'm at, this was just, this is basically an appreciation response. <laughs> Beautiful. Yes. Being, being there, understand the, the whole childbirth thing. So that's, uh, we won't, we won't get into that. Don't worry young people. <laughs> but anyway, thanks so much for sharing. Um, Joey, did you have anything to add to that before we sort of wrap up? Um, I feel a bit out of place because my general coping strategy is to go into the home gym I constructed um, several years ago when I was too sick to go to an actual one and then just try to lift as heavy shit as I can possible. Um, I recently scored a 200 kilo, so that was fun. Um, and then aside from that, I think, like I said, I found a technique that works for me. I think that's one of the biggest and I think that's one of the biggest lessons I took from, or have taken from my ongoing cancer journey. As I said before, um, I found a technique to cope during my treatment, turning things into a competition that worked for me. Um, but at the same time, I ne would never expect anybody else to replicate that if it didn't work for them. I insisted with myself throughout my time at canteen interacting with other young people that i would never judge people if they didn't cope the way that i did and i wouldn't um think you know that my technique for coping was better than anybody else's um and i think that's the really important thing that you um find a technique that works for you if you 
you know, if you enjoy painting, you unapologetically paint as a coping mechanism. If you enjoy reading, go ahead and read. Don't feel guilty. If you like nature walks, go ahead and do a nature walk. If you like going into your room, turning off all the lights and listening to thrash, slayer, death, grunge metal, you do that and you own that because that's what works for you. And you don't need to apologize for that. And you should never apologize for that because that is your own unique form of self care. That's what makes you unique. That's what makes you special. And if that helps you cope with this big, bad, terrible worlds, then fantastic. And, you know, bully for anybody that would try to change you because you don't owe them crap. No worries. And I'm going to let Josh have the very, very last word, but I wanted to say just a thank you to him because he's just been amazing. And um, I'm absolutely stunned. He'll be working at Channel 10 or something before we know it. But Josh, I'll give you the final word. But um, just from me personally to our three speakers, thank you so much. It's just been amazing hearing your stories and really inspiring. I think I have teared up about five or six times throughout the evening. I'm sure everyone else has too. And it's just so beautiful seeing all the comments in the chat. Um, so thank you very much. But Josh, I'll let you have the final word. Thank you. Um, the final word I'd like to say is that I reiterate my thanks so, so much. And going forward and in the past, I've just tried to live my life being the change I want to see in the world. And I see that that spirit and that energy and that wisdom in every single one of the panelists that have been here today. And I really, really appreciate it. If um, no one else desperately wants to say any words, I will uh, play some piano chords as we make our graceful exit from a wonderful night. <laughs> so thank you so much, everyone. Have a great night. Wonderful. Excellent exit. Thanks, guys. Josh, we love you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That was awesome. Incredible.